words of life. Words of life, words of hope, give us strength. Help us go. Help us go in this world. In this world, where we roam, where we roam, on a ancient world, you are ancient world, ancient world, ever true. we pray our father and our God king of glory the ancient of days how can we thank you enough for all you do for us this morning you have led us by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus into your presence the Lord made the time that you have brought us to you not be a wasted time, but be a time when you will use to fulfill your purpose in our lives. Transform us to the point that we are completely conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, your son. The identity with which we require to enter heaven. You are interested in our spiritual imaging to be transformed into the image of Jesus. So, Father, howsoever we have failed before you, how low we have gone, we have come to you, our Father, that you will lift us up again, that you will transform us, that you will do unto us that which no man can do. Father, we know that there is nothing you cannot do. What you, O oh Lord, cannot do does not exist. So we know that howsoever beaten we are, however sinful we are, however ignorant we are, you will open our eyes of understanding and lift us up to establish us with you. Lord, see us through. All oh, the trials, the temptations, the challenges, the distresses and the comforts, the discomforts of this world, Make us your people. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Shall we be seated? We've been reminded this morning, but let me say we are blessed this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been reminded this morning that the mega theme for August 2021 is overcoming challenges and tough times. And for today, we are looking at perfected by trials. This topic for discussion is coming at a time when we are challenged as Christians, when it has become, or is getting to a point where it looks like when you are a Christian, you are on the wrong side of life. Politically, socially, and every other thing the nation is going through is challenges as well. And I'm sure we hear some people saying, let us go apart and be on our own. I think that is called cessation also. Some call it self-determination. These are the challenges we face as a people, we face as a nation, and the church is also having its own share of this pain. This morning, or was it last night, I can't remember exactly. I was reading a news item where the governor of uh, Borno State is said to be uniting one of the Chibo girls to, their parent, to her parents, who was forcefully taken from school, forcefully married to a criminal, and forced to raise a family she did not consent to. And know what? 
80 or 90 percent of those children that were abducted are Christians. One would begin to ask, why? And this stress, these problems and challenges have come to a point where people have asked, why me? Why me? That shouldn't be the question. It should be not why me, but God, what do you want me to learn from this circumstance, this challenge, and this trial? That is what we are going to treat this morning. And I'd like us to read three texts. They are going to resonate and form part of what we're discussing. So uh, I would like us to read them together as they put them here. If they do, if they don't, somebody will help us read. We're looking at three texts in the Bible. The first is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. I was told this morning that I have limited time, so aha, it's here. Can we read it together, please? Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and our faith towards God. The second scripture I would like us to look at to form the anchor of our discussion today is 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to verse 18. And I'd like us to do the same exercise as Sunday school by force this morning. One, two, three, go. Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and internal weight of glory. Why we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are internal. Then finally, of the three texts, Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 4. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 4. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 4. And we'll do the same exercise again, please, if you don't mind me. One, two, three, go. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Praise the Lord. We will see quickly that there are three key words that resonate from the three scriptures we have written. Those three are perfection, trials, affliction, tribulations, which are same as affliction, trials, troubles, discomforts, distresses, and all that. Now, what does the Bible want us to understand about perfection? What is perfection within the context of the Bible? The Bible tells us that perfection within the context is completeness or maturity. Completeness or maturity. God wants us through Jesus to be complete, to be matured in him. Leave the basics of Christianity and move into the crucible of fire so that God can reform us. God can change us into the vessels that God wants us to, to be. In other words, God is saying that an exemplification of divine excellence is what we mean by perfection. That is, a Christian who has achieved the status of Christian life that is out of the comfort zone into the crucible of fire for purification, righteousness, holiness, total submission. 
So when people are talking about, I'm asking God for this, I'm asking God for that, this Christian is asking God for perfection. This Christian is asking God for purification. This Christian is asking God for holiness, which is not our business at the moment, but that is what God needs. Righteousness is what God needs. And these are the same things, total submission to, to, to God, which Jesus did, that today we are his disciples. The second word here is trials. We are perfected by trials. What does the Bible teach us about trials? What is the meaning of trials? A trial is a test of faith. A test of patience that creates enduring spiritual stamina through subjection to suffering or temptation. I began to ask myself, like you are doing as well, why would God perfect us through trials? Why? That is Bible study there. The words of God are in the, in the book of life. Why is God not using the Bible to perfect us? Why is he not even using the Holy Spirit who is with us and our teacher to perfect us? I think a teacher perfects the students, isn't it? So why is the Holy, God not using the Holy Spirit to perfect us? Why is God not using the blood of Jesus to perfect us? Because the blood of Jesus speaketh better things than what? The blood of Abel. Why is he not using that one? There may be many answers to this, but I'd like us to consider just about six because of the time we have. The six reasons why God will use trials to perfect us instead of the Bible, the word of God in the Bible, the Holy Spirit, or even the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We were at a point of sharing the reasons why God wants to use or perfect us through trials instead of the other options available to us which are easy. One of the reasons is that God wants to make the bride of Christ ready for him. And we will find the answer in Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. It will show us up here. That would be wonderful. That would be great. You are assisting me in this business. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. But when we look at the church today, you and I will know that the bride is not ready. And why is the bride not ready? The bride is not ready at the moment because the church is full of spots and wrinkles. And God wants to, perfect, to present a perfected bride to his son Jesus. The church today is polluted and full of filthy garments. Men and women are pursuing honor, influence and affluence, material wealth, instead of holiness, righteousness, and sanctification. Prosperity gospel has first taken the stage and the message of righteousness, the message of the narrow path, and the message of the broad way has first taken over the pulpit. Instead of God, Getting a voice from the pulpit, which is the church, God is getting a noise instead. God wants to get a voice out to his people. People who are transformed, people who are conformed to the image of Jesus. The church would even want to redefine the templates of God for entering heaven. That is the status of the church at the moment. God wants to make the bride of Christ ready for him. The church is polluted with sin, transgressions, and iniquity. Would I need to say that there is bitterness in the church? Would I need to say there is competition in the church? Do you want me to say that there is unforgiveness and anger even among Christians? Do you want me to say that there is hatred and spiritual stagnation and dryness in the church? God is not moving again, and God wants to move to prepare us as a bride for his son, Jesus. 
we will see more the works of the flesh than the fruit of the spirit, which we heard here the other day. We will see more of the works of the flesh than the fruit of the spirit, which we find in Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to verse 23. It makes me feel that as a church today, we are like one of these churches mentioned in Revelations, and this church is called the Church of Laodicea. You know about this church very well. Its activities, status, is captured in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 to 18. This church said that it was rich, it was increased, it had need of nothing. But until God evaluated that church, let God evaluate you today and tell you the status of where you stand between you and him and on this journey of life. Let God evaluate me as a Christian, as an individual, to see exactly how I stand when the church did not allow God to examine them, to evaluate them. God evaluated them and this is how God found them in Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 to 18. How did God find them? God found them to be wretched. God found them to be miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That is why God wants to transform our character into the image of his son by doing three things. First, clothing us with righteousness. Number two, beautifying us. And number three, perfecting us through trials to meet his standard. As many of us today that desire to meet the standard of God, and that is why you are here today. That is why at home we are praying. That is why we will hold on to God until he blesses us like Jacob did. Jacob said, I will never let you go unless you do what? You bless me. Today, Father, we are here holding on to the foot of the cross. Falling at your presence saying, no matter how we are, we are submitting to you. Perfect us and take us to that level where we will be the image of Jesus. We will conform to his character. Our character will become his and we will become like him. Praise the Lord. Second reason why God is perfecting us through trials is that God wants, us to, God wants to transform us into the image of his son. What does God want to do? Transform us into the image of his son. Spiritual imaging is very important to God. To us it may not be important, but to God it is very important. It means God wants us to take up the character of Christ, the nature of Jesus, his likeness, his behavior, his having a mind of Christ, uh, we having a mind of Christ, Christ's temperament. And you know when we talk about temperament, that is where most of us have problems. I have an uncle, but this one is said better in chief than in English, if my chief will permit me. <laughs> and I know that you understand chief now very well. Now, someone annoyed my uncle one day. And you know what he said? Today, I'm going to show this man that he only knows my name, not my character. In Tib, we will say, Onefakati yam saying, we fanja yam, we kenya o fanja yam. Now, that is what God wants to transform into the character of Jesus. God wants to work on our obedience, doing just like Jesus would do, doing things like Jesus would do. And then, having the life of Jesus. Indeed, this is God's highest message for the church today here on earth and in eternity. Not just here on earth, but in eternity. If we achieve all without the image of Jesus, we have achieved nothing. If we have achieved all without the image of Jesus, we have achieved what? Nothing. That is why the Bible asks, what shall it profit a man if he does what? Gains the whole world but loses his own soul. Let us allow God to transform us into the image of his son. Now, 
the image that has the image without Jesus is automatically the image of Satan. This is like it's not like a military operation where you have the enemy on that side, you have your own troops this way, the enemy on that side, and in the middle, they call it no man's land, middle ground. There's nothing like that in Christianity. You are either for God or for Satan. And if you do not carry the image of God, then automatically you are carrying the image of Satan. And that is where the devil wins the argument. When God looks at you and me, and he does not find the image of Jesus. And the devil said, see the image this one is carrying. It's not the image of Jesus. It's my own image. What do you expect God to do? Hand over now, Abby. But as many of us today that desire to attain the image of Jesus, the Lord will transform us. And the devil will not lay claim unto us in the mighty name of Jesus. There was a day... In fact, the day Jesus was to be arrested, to be taken to the cross. He saw that those people coming, but the disciples did not see it. What is important in this circumstance was this. Jesus says, the prince of this world cometh, but he finds no part in me. That is the image God wants to transform us into. Now, talking about images, the, images, the image we carry here determines our eternity. Now, talking about images, how important it is to God, I just want to give two examples. Number one, you remember one day some people came to test Jesus about obligation to pay taxes. We remember that story? And they asked him, Rabbi, Master, Son of God, is it uh, lawful for us to pay taxes because we cannot serve God and mammon. The money is mammon. So can, can we take this one and pay tax to that one? What did Jesus say? We remember? What did he do? He said, bring a coin to me, isn't it? And when they brought the coin, what did Jesus do? He said, see, whose image do you see there? What did they say? Caesar was a very wicked king. There was nothing godly about that man, except that all authorities are appointed by Jesus and by God. Therefore, Caesar was appointed into that position by God. That was all that was godly about him. And he was created by God. But when Jesus saw that image, what did he do? He said, do what to Caesar? Huh? That is what God does when it comes to a spiritual imaging. When you carry the image of Caesar, what happens? Gives you to Caesar. When you carry the image of the devil, what does God do? But God doesn't want to give anyone or that is why he's toiling day and night. He is present with you at every time. When you go tri through trials, God is with you. Jesus is with you. The Holy Spirit is inside you. It's around you. It's on you. It's all over you. So God does not want to lose us to lose at all. And I'm told the story of one little boy again about imaging, who uh, he told his father, you see, dad, today we will need to buy lunch at school. And the father said, uh, how much do you need uh, uh, for this lunch? You know the answer he gave? He was also using imaging. He said, I need uh, Baba, today I will need the five muritala. He will need what? You know what that means. How much is, what is, how much is that one? 20, 20? 100 naira. Is it 100 naira? You know, I am, I am so rich that I have lost count. And I don't know which image is, Muritala is representing. He said, I, I want five Muritala. I want five Ikoku. I want five Azikiwe. And I want five Clement this song. That's all that will cost me for, 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 for lunch today. I, I, know, I don't know the other, but I know the last one. Dr. Clement this song. I think that one is how much? 1,000. Hey, but for me, I won't ask for five. Oh, I was a small boy. I'll be asking for maybe trillions. 
or does uh, Clement his son. So the images on that morning define the request of this one. Our image determines our final destination, whether it is heaven or hell. But God desires that we should not go to hell, but we should go to heaven. And that is why he's working on our images to carry the image of Jesus. Because the visa to heaven is the image of Jesus after salvation. You know, heaven, I, sometimes I see us behaving as if heaven is a PDP or APC or ABGA. What are the other ones? Help me now. Eh? SDP, go. I don't know whether that SDP still exists. Or. Which other one again? You know, what I'm, all that I'm trying to say is that heaven, PDP, uh, uh, Papa DC, Peking, uh, that one, I'm not talking about that one. Why I brought all this is very simple. Eh? Why I brought this is very simple. You know, heaven is not a political party. Heaven is not a marketplace where you have spiritual talks, where you have spiritual thieves, area boys, where you have jagoda, where excess luggage can be carried and you still enter inside. It doesn't work that way. Here, not everything goes, but there everything goes. God is not the author of confusion. It's a God of order. You must carry the image of his son to qualify. And that is why we are here this morning. And as many of us that desire to carry the image of Jesus, may God qualify us by force, by fire, in Jesus' name. Amen. Another reason why God is perfecting us through trials is that we are Precious jewels in God's hands. We are precious jewels in God's hands. But unfortunately, we are still in the raw form. Unfortunately, we are what? In the raw form. We are not saying you are not a Christian. We are not saying I am not a Christian. We are a Christian, but we are still struggling with some things. So what God is doing is that God is chiseling us. You know when you go to the jeweler's shop, you will see the jeweler will carry one diamond. He will be doing like this. Cheap. Cheap, 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 cheap. When they bring it from, uh, from uh, wherever they, they got it, the mines, what does God do? What does the jeweler do? First, he will not use that small hammer. He may use sometimes even a sledgehammer. When it is necessary, God will even use a jackhammer, the one operated by hydraulics to get the best out of us. That is what God is doing. Now, we can't remain in our own form. So God is still working on us, transforming us, perfecting us through trials so we can remain useful and precious vessels in his hands. Another reason why God is changing us through trials, perfecting us is that we must suffer as Christ did to be perfected. As Christians, we must suffer as Christ did to be perfected. God can't use a different standard for his son and use a different standard for his other children. God is a God of justice and righteousness. So, God, we allow us to suffer as Christ did to be perfected. And we will find the evidence of this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21. Because Christ also suffered. And God highly exalted him. He wants us before we wear the crown of glory to suffer like Jesus. And I began to ask myself, why must God perfect us through trials? The answer is simple, number one. Through suffering, we know Jesus the more. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. 
Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. Through suffering, we know Jesus the more. Secondly, we can't compare the present trials with the coming glory or the future glory that God has prepared for his church. We find the evidence of that in Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Romans 8, 18. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13. In the, so keep us keep uh, Romans there. I love that. Romans 8:18, 8, that I may know him and the power. Okay, it's gone away. I'm sure you took notes on that one, so let me move on again. Now, we learn obedience through suffering. That's what the Bible, we learn obedience through suffering. That's what the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. We learn obedience through suffering. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 to 9. And then, all things work together. That's another reason for our good. We were told that this morning, we reminded about that as well. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good. Now, God, the fifth reason is God is trying our faith for perfection. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 6. God is trying our faith for perfection. God is trying our faith for perfection. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5 to 6. And lastly, number 6, I told us we will consider six things. So the sixth one is, God is developing in us patience. God is developing in us patience. Patience, experience experience and hope. That is what these trials are to do. Then, the next question is, what are these trials we go through? The Bible says in John chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus said, in this word, you shall have what? Tribulations. In this word, you shall have tribulations. Tribulation is the master word that engulfs sufferings, discomfort, all those kind of things, tribulations uh, handles that. And then Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 20, John 15, 20, John 15, 20, Jesus said, we must be persecuted because he also was persecuted. All forms of stress, discomforts, sicknesses, barrenness, hatred, impossible children, and all that. Perhaps right now, you are having your own portion. Because I hear Christians say, it's not my portion in Jesus' name. I, I thought Paul would say that as well. On the day that Prophet Agabus came, took a mantle and tied around his legs and hands and said, the person who owns this uh, mantle, this is the problem he is going to, to face. This is the affliction. These are the distresses. These are the discomforts. Apostle Paul said, I am even ready not to suffer, but to also die for the sake of the cross. That is how God wants us to transform us, to be, uh, transfers, transform us into, and uh, we should be like Jesus. Perhaps you are mourning it. Perhaps you are in some financial stress. Perhaps you can't even visit your village now because of headsmen and bond, uh, what do they call them, bandits, uh, you know, they we. Uh, sorry? And no government. Those ones came up recently. And no government. That's another appellation. And uh, how can government be unknown? What I do know is that soldiers are unknown. You remember when they went to Fela in those days? Uh, Justice Aniagolu said, these are unknown soldiers. So we used to know about unknown soldiers, but now it is unknown government. How can you be firing a gun and I won't know? Anyway, that is not a problem here now. Now, perhaps you are into a debt. You are under some form of stress. I may not be able to mention that, but you know it. I know the stress I'm going through as well. But I'm holding on to Jesus. He is the author and finisher of my faith. He will take me through. You know what you are going through. And here is the good news. Here is the good news. God is in it with you. God is in it with me. 
God will see us through. That is, what God cannot do does not exist. I hear one pastor say that and I love it. He said, what God cannot do does not exist. And I think we will say it together. What God cannot do does not exist. If he wants us to go through it, he is using it to perfect us. If he wants us to endure through it, he's changing us from one degree of glory to the other. It shouldn't provoke questions like, why me? It should provoke a question like, God, my father, you're not the best for me. What is it that you want me to learn out of this circumstance? Develop me all the same. Change me all the same. Chisel me all the same. Pass me through the fire all the same. Didn't Job tell us that when I have gone through the fire, I will come out better than gold? Let us be like Job. Trust God that he knows the best and he's doing the best for us. Now, that introduces the last question and I'm going to sit down. Knowing all this, how do we respond to trials? How do we respond to tribulations? How do we respond to stresses, problems, challenges? How do we respond to them? I want us to do one thing that I have tried to do myself. It can be tough as I'm standing here talking. <laughs> Sometimes I come to the point of asking God, why me too? But I have learned through that process not to ask again. What I do is, I ask, what does he want me to learn from this? In Lamentations chapter 3, verse 21, Jeremiah is saying, this I record to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is for the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Here is a good better news too. They are new every morning. The mercies of God have sustained us yesterday for those trials and challenges of yesterday. God will renew them newer than yesterday. And as many of us that are facing challenges and are depending on what happened yesterday, God is renewing it today. And I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, he will continue to renew them in Jesus' name. Because that is his word. He has spoken it, not me. So what we need to do is to remember we remember. When you don't remember, when you don't go back on the memory lane, that is a problem. What do you remember? You will remember that it is God's best plan for you that you go through this. To carry the image of Jesus, it is the best plan of God for you. I will find the answer in Jeremiah 29, 11. What does God say there? For I know, you may not know, but God, that's why God knows. I may not know, but God knows. He knows I know my plans for you. Plans for what? For good and not for evil. To give you an expected end and a future. So if God knows, I don't need to know. If God know, knows, what do I need to do? I don't need to know. Because he's working out the best for me. Second is remember, the pain is not permanent but temporary. We hear what the Apostle Paul said in our main text. See also, First uh, Peter chapter one verse five to six. First Peter chapter one, verse five to six. Remember, the pain is not permanent but temporary. Thirdly, how to respond to trials is to rejoice and give thanks, even when you don't feel thankful. You will find that this in First Thessalonians chapter five verse eighteen. The Bible says. Give thanks in all things. Why do we need to give thanks even when we don't feel thankful? Because we know. Because we know. That for sure, God will use it to fulfill his purpose in our lives. For sure I know, God will use it to fulfill his purpose in our lives. Job said, for I know my Redeemer liveth. If the situations around me would not show that 
my redeemer liveth me, I know that my redeemer liveth and he will do what? Set me free on the last day. Number four, I will then follow Job's model. When we read the Bible, we look at models in the Bible that will always help us to meet challenge, to respond to challenges and to respond to problems. Look at what Job did. I would like us to read it like we read the first one. I say, follow Job's model. In Job chapter 1, Job chapter 1, verse 20 to verse 21. Job chapter 1, verse 20 to verse 21. Is it here? I would like us to read this together, please. One, two, three, go. Then Job arose, tore his robes, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. The next one. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is a man who had lost all. He lost his business. This is a man who had lost a family. This is a man who had lost his head. He had lost his, all his finances. And all he would do is to worship. Naked I came into this world. Naked would I return. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken. That is a man who knows the purpose of what God is doing in his life. And he said, Blessed be the name of the Lord. I pray this morning that God will take us to that level as we allow him to perfect us through trials. To say like Job, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. That's another example I want us to look at quickly, then we, I'm not wasting time. I, I, I'll round up. The example of Apostle Paul. The model that he gave us, and I'm hinging that on one of the points on how we respond to trials. Never, ever give up. As a young boy, will be about Several years back, I was a student in a military academy. We were told the story of uh, Winston Churchill, the Prime Minister of England at the time of the Second World War. They say he was coming to address um, generals, soldiers going to war. And you know what uh, Winston Churchill did? He said, people were prepared to hear a long speech. Churchill came in. And this is what he said, never, ever give up. That was the end of the speech. So how do we respond to trials? It's like what church he said to these soldiers, never, ever give up. Let us say it together. Never, ever give up. That's what God wants us to do. And let us look at how Paul, the apostle, responded to this principle. Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9 to 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9 to 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9 to 10. Let us, let us please read it together. This, I think, is the last one. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Never, ever give up. Hold on to Jesus. Every time it looks so tough, fall at the feet of the cross. Tell God to help you. He knows you have no power of your own. He knows I don't have power of my own. Me that is standing here talking today, he's using as a vessel. I don't have power of my own. It comes from on high. Ask him to help you, and he will do so. Most of the times, people begin to think that God is selecting us out 
for something so terrible and tough. No. God loves us. That is why when we are going through these trials and tribulations, persecutions, distresses, and challenges, God is in there with us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. He will be present to the very end. In concluding, there are four women, my mothers, my great mothers I love in the Bible. One of them is called Sarah. The second is called Ruth. Ruth was not even an Israelite. The third is called Hannah. And the fourth is called Elizabeth. When it appeared like God was missing in action, what Rick Warren would say, the pastor in the US, when God appears to be missing in action, God is on a war, absence without leave. You pray, you seek him when you are going through trials. You do everything, you fast. You fast until you lose weight. You become smaller than I am. Nothing seems to be happening. But for sure, like he came for this woman, this woman, he will sure come for you. Never ever give up. Jesus is in the boat with you. He will wither the storms with you. And he is his job to do that, not you. The Lord showed up for them. He will also show up for you. Hold on. God is watching over you. Let us pray. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Realizing that you have no power to help yourself, let us take a short chorus as we pray. I have no power of my own, of my own. I have no power of my own. I confess to you.